I never know why people send me stuff. <laughs> um, I got this from uh, someone in California. It's a cartoon of the better half. Uh, and since I get all my news from the Yahoo, I don't get a newspaper, so I don't know what the better half is, but it's a cartoon uh, thing, you know. Anybody read the comics? No? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> then this will be new to you, too. Anyway, the wife is talking to the husband on the sofa. I'm bored, restless, depressed, disenchanted, and hopeless. But aside from that, I'm very happy. <laughs> I don't know why people send me these things, but, uh, <laughs> but it, got, it did actually get me thinking that you know, in our lives we, uh, we settle for certain things. We get used to the condition we're in. We get, we get uh, comfortable in our discomfort, and there's a certain happiness uh, that we can feel um, in, our, uh, in our circumstances. And it got me thinking about uh, these five choices that shape our lives. And, um, and that led me to this passage in uh, John chapter 5. Um, and this choice is the one that Jesus will ask here, here in a minute. Um, do you want to be well? Do you, do you want to be well? Uh, or would you prefer to, to stay the way we are? You know? So um, you probably know this passage by heart, but I'll read it anyway from John chapter 5. Um, so sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. And now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, uh, which in Aramaic is called Beth Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water stirred. While I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me in line. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And, and once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. And the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he said, The man who made me well said, Pick up your mat and walk. And they asked him, Well, who is this person who told you to do that? And the man who had been healed had no idea who it was. So let's pray. Lord, teach us from your word and show us uh, what you might do in us and through us as we learn to look at our lives through your eyes instead of uh, our own. Um, amen. This is a very, um, to me, it's a very interesting passage that's filled with life and vitality, and it's one that I have heard and probably have preached wrongly about many times, and I've heard it preached badly. Uh, this passage has been used uh, to basically to whip people who are sick. <laughs> and say, you know, if you would have wanted to be well, then you would have been, you know. And why don't you just think better about it. And, and I've heard that sermon so many times over the years. I've, I've been really hesitant to preach on this. Because the first thought is, well, obviously, if you just want to get well, then you just are. And I have found that that actually isn't always the case. And in fact, in this passage, there are obviously dozens or hundreds of people who Jesus didn't go to and heal. And they, and they stayed there at the pool. However, having said that, this passage is so uh, meaningful to me because it, it gets right to the heart of uh, what it is that uh, happens in our life that can, uh, that can literally paralyze us, but, that, but can also emotionally and spiritually paralyze us. And we get to be okay with that because it's what we know. And, and we start to be okay with that which we know. And then when God wants to, to open us up to something new, we're kind of resistant to it. And it's hard for us to understand what God might want to do in us or through us because we're okay. You know, God can go help somebody else who really needs it. You know, we're, we're basically okay. Now, um, Um, I found this great quote from Darwin, Charles Darwin, 
You never thought I'd be quoting Darwin in here. Well, there you go. See, that's the kind of place we are. So Charles Darwin said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives. I thought that's what he said, right? No, he said it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but rather the one most responsive to change. That's who survives. The one that's most responsive to change. I always thought it was survival of the fittest. No, it's survival of those who can change and accept change and, and adapt to it. And I thought about that in this case because we're going to see somebody who, you know, Jesus is right there wanting to bring about change in their life. And I believe it was a little more difficult than, than this passage shows. So, um, so let's look at it. First of all, we have this uh, sheep gate, which by the way, if the sheep were going there and there's a pool, I don't know that I'd want to get into it, but that's, that's a whole other thing. They specify the, a pool at the sheep gate, no kidding. Uh, and it's surrounded with five covered colonnades, you can see that, and a large number of disabled people that would lie there. And, um, and the, the tradition was, the belief was that, that periodically an angel would stir up the water and it would start bubbling. And when it did, if you could get into the water quickly, at that time, you'll be healed. And evidently, over the years, people have periodically been healed as the, as the mineral springs welled up and the bubbles were going, right? And so now Jesus finds this guy who's been there 38 years, which, and those are, that's a lifetime. And he's been there uh, every day waiting um, with, his, with his friends and waiting. And, and Jesus stops and asks him, do you want to be well? Which is a very odd question, right? You don't just walk up to people and say, do you want to be well? You know, because obviously, well, of course you do, you know. But I love his answer. He doesn't answer it, does he? He doesn't answer the question. Do you want to be well? What does he do? Make some excuses, that's right. Make some excuses just like I would do. Oh. <laughs> you know, you ask me if I want to be well. Well, you know there's a way this thing works. And, and, it's, and when the bubbles come and then you, other people have friends and family who care enough to stay here and help them in or hold back the crowd so that they can get in. I have nobody who cares enough to be here with me and to help me and these people nobody will care and so by the time even if I see the bubbles first by the time I work my way over there somebody else has gotten in in front of me you know the greedy people who get there first before I can and what a great excuse if these people would be more loving more considerate if we had a number system like Baskin Robbins, you know, where you take that number and nobody can get their ice cream before you, that makes sense, you know? The system's against me, the people are against me, my own family doesn't help me. I am in this situation. Those are wonderful excuses, by the way. It's all about them, it's all about this or that or the other never actually mentioned himself. And then Jesus just kind of ignores his answer and says, okay, well then, you, you know, if you want to be healed, why don't you get healed and here, you know, get up, take your mat, don't leave it here, uh, you know, and, and get out of here. Now, that in itself is very simple, right? Mm -hmm. Then I start thinking, what would make it difficult for this person to get up and take his mat and walk. And years ago, I, I was reading a, a New Testament scholar who, was, who said something about, I wonder if he wanted the treatment everybody else got and might have felt bad missing it. And that got me thinking, I can't remember where I read that, but I, it stuck in my mind. And I thought, I wonder about that because, you know, you think about it, this guy has been there, how long? 38 years. 38 years, almost four decades, he has sat there and he has watched other people see the bubbles, get help getting into the bubbles and getting well, and he has probably dreamed every day of his life what it would feel like when it was his turn and he could go in and get in those bubbles and experience the healing and come out and everybody cheer and, yeah, you know, it happened to you, you know, after all this time, go for it, you know, and, and they're all with him. And you think, that would be so wonderful. 
And everybody would know and, and uh, the miracle would take place. Now, Jesus is saying, they're sitting, well, okay, get up, get your, get your mat and go. Wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus, how about we do the miracle the right way? You get the bubbles going. Get your followers to hold back the crowd and you help me into the water and I can experience the bubbles, get healed, come out, have everybody cheering. That's the way it's done here. Well, no, just, just get up and, and go. In fact, there's a side way. You can go right out there through the sheep gate. Watch your step. I wonder if he wasn't deeply disappointed. Jesus. This is not the way I'd expect it. This is not what I'd hoped for. This is not the way I dreamed about it. This is not the way it's done. I don't want to just get up and take my nap and walk out the side door. I want the bubbles. <laughs> I want the bubbles. Is that asking too much, Lord? Just give me some bubbles like everybody else got. And so he had to let go of his healing the way he wanted it to be on his terms and his expectations and, um, and really the disappointment in the way God was working. And I, I, I know, you know a lot of folks here in this room, you know, we, we have disappointments in how God works. We go, well, Lord, I trust you, but you know, you could have done it better or different or... You could have consulted with me, and I could have told you the right way to do this, Lord. I'm not naming names, and I'm not making eye contact. But you on the video know who you are. Yeah, that's right. Okay, just checking that. Um, so you deal with the disappointment. Now, the other thing is, this, if he's going to actually be healed, it... it comes around, always does, it comes around to there's he's going to be responsible in some ways. And I think that that's a very difficult thing. For example, in 38 years, no one ever harassed him for carrying his mat working on the Sabbath. He was free from any accusation. He was actually pretty pious. He never violated the Sabbath by walking too far or carrying too much. Uh, he was free of that. And now the minute he gets healed and does what Jesus says, he's in trouble. Doing what Jesus tells him to do and he's in trouble. Is that fair? No. It's not fair. And and uh, and so now, and, and then they're saying, well, who, oh yeah, somebody told you to do this and you're doing it because of them? Well, who was it? I don't know. So somebody did this and told you to do that and you don't even know who it is? No. Right. Um, and all of a sudden he's in trouble for doing what Jesus says and um, he doesn't even know how to respond in that situation because for 38 years it's not been an issue and now suddenly what people think of him and their standards is now an issue so you have this disappointment with God and you have this new responsibility that gets him in trouble um, and, and in, the, in the middle of all of that this um, amazing um, experience in which he has had 38 years of community, friends, others around him. They talk all day together. They see each other. Hey, how's it going? And they've really become family together at the Colonnades, right? And now he's not a part of it. He's going to have to get up and go and this won't be his world anymore. Could you imagine how sad that might be? If, if, if Jesus heals me and I go out of here, I have no place, to, where am I gonna be? Where am I gonna find new friends? Where am I going to find a new community and a new family? And so he has to actually give up the very thing that's given him his identity and his uh, loving relationships and all of these things for all these years, that's going to be over now. So I can see that this would be a very difficult thing for him. And uh, 
No wonder he's blaming Jesus for, for wrecking his life. There's a new normal. And you know that phrase comes around. Um, I heard it the first time from a friend of mine, uh, Jim Eaton, back in Minnesota. Uh, we were good friends, and he called me up uh, one day and was just heartbroken because his um, grandson, who was four years old, um, had died suddenly uh, from a, an infection he got in the hospital. And, uh, and got, went to the hospital for a treatment and got sepsis and died suddenly. And so now Jim's daughter, uh, Emily, is heartbroken and uh, she's lost her son. He's lost a grandson and he's grieving because, you know, grandparent, you know, you grieve for the kids and the grandchild. You, you get a double pain in that, right? And Jim called me and we sat and cried and talked about it. And, um, and he, he said, my daughter started a, a blog in which she's going to try and process you know, as she goes through this, and uh, it's on uh, JulianGolden.com. Uh, that was his name, Julian Golden. And uh, and I started following her blog, and she kept talking about the new normal. There's a new normal. This isn't normal for for us. This isn't normal for our family. But we have this new normal that we didn't really ask for, but this is now what's going on. And we have to figure out what it means to live and to love and to trust and to move forward in our life in these new circumstances. And I have so appreciated her, her writing as she's gone through it because she's been so vulnerable. And, uh, and I thought, you know, we all have a new normal. When Jesus comes to us and says, do you want to be well? And, and then he begins his work of healing us uh, in a number of ways and, and we start to become healthy, our world changes. The way people relate to us. You know, the, uh, every movie that's any good that's ever been made, I think, has been the theme of there's a dysfunctional family or group and or friends and then one of them starts to get well and that affects the relationships in the group, right? And everything goes crazy because this one person is getting healthy and it messes up the system. Take that theme out and there's no more movies for Academy Award night tonight. <laughs> and we, we almost have an investment in each other staying unhealthy because of, at least this guy was quiet, you know, he knew, he knew what was going on. He had the system. He wasn't bothering anybody. Now he's disrupting. Uh, church leaders are upset. Uh, uh, I hate to upset church leaders, you know. Um, and of course, I, I go along with that because I think, you know, yeah, the perfect church where everybody's quiet except me, you know. And uh, and they go, yeah, but that wouldn't be healthy. If Jesus is growing us to health then we might have all kinds of issues going on, right? We might have all kinds of things happening in our lives as our new normal takes place. Now, how do we, how do we, um, how do we live with these choices of do you want to be well or not? And you know, we've been looking at the five choices that, that shape our lives. I think we're about the seventh one. <laughs> this is the seventh of the series. And I don't know when this series is going to end. But it's still five choices that shape our life. And because uh, I don't want to confuse it by changing it midstream. But um, this is a big choice for me. Do I want to be well? Do I want to be well? And I start thinking about that. What would I have to give up in order to be well? One thing is, I would have to give up my need to be right. My need to be right. I would have to set that aside in order to be well. Uh, you know, you can be right or you can be well, but you can't be both. If you have to be right, you're not going to be healthy. I think, wow. I spent a lot of time getting the way I am. You know, I hate to have that challenged, or I hate to, I hate to uh, admit that maybe I'm wrong. Do I want to be well? Do I want to be well enough to let go of that, lose that? 
Um, do I want to be well enough to let go of my excuses for why I'm the way I am? You know, if it wasn't for my nutty family that I grew up in, you know, wacky really, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be this way. You know, if I had a family like yours, I'd be, oh, I'd be like you. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the trap, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to trade families because <laughs> then we'd all be like that. Okay, so, um, but the thing is, I, I'd have to give up on my excuses. Well, if that hadn't happened to me, you know, I wouldn't be in this situation. At all. And Jesus goes, I don't care. I really don't. You want to be well? Yeah, but don't you, don't you? Yeah, I don't care about that. You know, that is so past. Do you want to be well now? You mean? Oh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard, isn't it? Um, one of the things that um, I found was that um, what I do is I kind of share a bunch of stuff and then I feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I shouldn't have shared that because people are uncomfortable, you know. And, uh, and that authenticity thing, it drives me crazy. I would, I'd like to be well and not be authentic. Wouldn't it be great to be able to be well and healthy following Jesus in a phony way, in a superficial, shallow way, really, uh, that, that looks good on the outside? Wouldn't that be great? I remember there was a time I used to complain. I, I was in a small group with some pastors and their spouses, and... Uh, uh, and I'd share just to get the sharing going and then they'd all talk about how great their life was and I'd walk home feeling like a schmuck you know <laughs> uh, why did I even bother and I remember my old, my old boss Bruce Larson said okay so you're going to let the really unhealthy people determine whether or not you're going to be healthy or not you know that if you stop sharing you're going to become really sick more than you already are and uh, the only way to be healthy is to be real. And are you going to let them keep you from being real? Make you unhealthy like them? Still, it's not fair. And, uh, and I realized, okay, um, I have to give up my idea of looking good. And I really do have an idea of looking good. You know, it's just I've not achieved it. But I, I, I have that idea, you know, along. So this week I was down in uh, Cannon Beach. Oregon on the coast, never been there before, didn't realize that you have to twist and turn to get there. Um, I reached speeds upwards of 25 miles an hour. Yeah. While the logging trucks were bearing down on me, you know, it's, anyway, that's another thing. So I get there, it's this pastors and spouses conference from all over the Northwest. And, uh, and the first night, I called Eileen, when I got back to my room after the first night, I kind of was sharing stuff, you know, about West, Westphalian stuff, you know, nothing good. <laughs> but, uh, and I get back to the room and they said, how did it go? And I went, I am so depressed. I, I, I should just get in the car and go now. This is horrible, you know. And she said, what do you mean? I went, well, you know, I'm sharing all this stuff. And they're looking at me like, kind of like our dog looks at me, you know. <laughs> Maggie, we're kind of, one ear hanging down and kind of, what is this? Martha, you ever heard anything like that? I thought we were going to get a good Bible study. Instead, we got the ramblings of a man, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, and she says, oh, I'm sure it's not that bad, you know? And I'm thinking, no, I'm going in tomorrow and I'm going to give them a Bible study. That's it. No more sharing for me, you know? And of course, I'm incapable of doing that. So, <laughs> and, it, and it worked out wonderful. And we brought, they got, they had a night to sleep on it and figure out what was going on and all these things. And, um, and I realized I almost let myself change into an unhealthy thing to be accepted by the pastors and their spouses. And, and it was only by the grace of God that I was able to keep on being the troubled person that I am and keep sharing that. But um, of course what happens is then the next two days everybody comes alongside and starts sharing their issues and, um, and it became a great uh, loving healing, healing for me healing for all of us as we shared together and, and grew through it. Wouldn't have happened had I gone back to the well, just give them a Bible study and get on your way. And, uh, and I, I realized that um, we look to other people for clues to what is healthy 
instead of allowing God to say, let me make you healthy in a new way, in a way that may be troublesome to others, in a way that may be disruptive to the way things are, in a way that may disappoint you because it's not exactly the way you thought it was going to be, in a way that may be frustrating because you'll have responsibilities and blame and this and that, and your excuses will fall away, and, and the way you've had to operate won't be that way anymore. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he'd been in this condition for a long time, he said, do you want to get well? I think this is one of the biggest choices we have to make in our life. Do we want to get well? Do we want to trust God for a new future that's different than we planned? I think a lot of times we choose no. You know, Lord, you come into my life, you be my Savior and Lord, and let me just go on the way I am. Because I'm pretty good at it. And I've got my system. And he goes, but don't, don't you want to be well? Well, you know, if others were different, I, you know, maybe, but, you know, the way things are, I get along better in the church, you know, if I'm this way. Don't want to be disruptive. Don't you want to be well? But then we could say yes. I do. I'm willing to give up my expectations and my frustrations and my way of doing things and my need to be right. I could give that up and experience life on a whole other level. It'll mean I'm going to have to trust you because I don't know what's ahead. Jesus goes, that would be great. Why not trust me? Instead of the way it's always been done. So I encourage you, make the choice. You want to be well? You can say, no, not right now. Check back with me in another 38 years. <laughs> or you can say, well, I don't know, but okay. I'll say yes. And I'll trust you for the rest. So I want to encourage you to choose wellness. Choose health. Choose Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would come into our lives, that you'd come up to us while we're in our circumstances and our situation and we're in our place where we're comfortable and we know everybody and we know the way it's supposed to be. And you come up to us and confront us with the truth and confront us with a new opportunity and Lord give us the courage to hear you in a fresh way give us the courage to see you in a new way and give us the courage to follow you in a new way Lord we would be healthy we would be well by your grace alone